All right, respiration and artificial ventilation part two. While we often don't think it, oxygen is considered a drug. And there were some efforts years ago to regulate it like we do other drugs in a pharmacy. Uh, and that would have just been a nightmare for EMS because we give oxygen to almost everybody. Um, we are finding out, however, that oxygen can be harmful. Uh, when we make people hyperoxic, we create free radicals, and free radicals destroy healthy tissue. So when we administer oxygen, it should be administered based on the overall evaluation of your patient's condition. Um, do they need oxygen? Is there any evidence that they need oxygen? Do they have an increased work of breathing? Uh, are they cyanotic? Uh, are they complaining of feeling short of breath or having trouble breathing? Uh, oxygen therapy equipment is extremely portable. It's lightweight, safe, and d dependable. Uh, you also have installed uh, larger tanks uh, inside the ambulance as well. Uh, the size of the tanks, uh, uh, the lower the number in the alphabet, the smaller the tank. I believe the one on the bottom is an E cylinder. Um, or a D cylinder and the one above it an E cylinder, uh, but both of these would be portable tanks uh, with a regulator. Uh, we know it's an oxygen tank because it has green. Uh, all kinds of gases are stored in tanks and oxygen tanks have uh, a very uh, unique pin indexing system so that the only thing that can connect to the yoke of the tank is a oxygen regulator and oxygen tanks are green. Here's a, a fixed unit, uh, a larger uh, either an M or an H cylinder uh, that's placed inside an ambulance. Uh, obviously the smaller cylinders aren't going to last as long as a larger cylinder so we keep the larger cylinders in the ambulance for transports and those sort of things. Uh, D cylinder That'd be the smaller one. Uh, holds about 350 liters of oxygen, an E cylinder about 625 liters of oxygen, and an M cylinder about 3,000 liters of oxygen. A G about 5,300 liters, and an H cylinder about 6,900 liters. Um, oxygen cylinders use pressure gauges or regulators and oxygen tubing to deliver oxygen to the patient. Uh, when uh, tightening oxygen gauges and regulators onto a tank, it's important that uh, we use a non-ferrous wrench or a wrench that isn't made of metal. Um, the the uh, issue here is the potential for a spark. Uh, while oxygen is not flammable, it does support combustion. Uh, so if I had an oxygen-rich environment and I uh, generated a spark, that spark could cause uh, or catch a piece of clothing or something on fire and because the environment was rich in oxygen the fire would burn really bright um, and uh, really hot. Uh, so we want to use non-ferrous wrenches. We want to ensure that the valve seat inserts and the gaskets are in good condition and use only medical grade oxygen. Um, there is 100% oxygen in an oxygen tank. Unlike an SCBA that a firefighter or a scuba diver would wear, uh, an SCBA has air in it. And air only has 21% oxygen and 79% uh, nitrogen as well as a few other elements. Um, so use a green tank or a stainless steel tank with a green lid. Um, once we put the regulator or prior to putting the regulator on the oxygen tank, uh, you often will open the valve of the oxygen cylinder uh, in order to uh, blow out any dust or debris that may be in the pin indexing system. And then you tighten the regulator on, making sure that it uh, fits in the pin indexing system well. Uh, it's got a new uh, seal or gasket on it, uh, which comes standard on every tank. Uh, a tank 
the when you get it new or filled, the yolk is wrapped in a um, a, a new uh, gasket is uh, in that wrapping. Um, Oxygen should be stored in a cool, ventilated room. If they're stored upright, they need to be stored in a, cont a container or uh, clamped in a, uh, um, a storage thing with wheels. Uh, the purpose for that is if you just set an oxygen cylinder up and it falls down and the yoke would snap off or break, um, now you have a missile and uh, it will... Um, propel itself with all the pressure that's inside of it uh, to the point where it'll even punch a hole in a cement wall. Uh, so you want to make sure that when you're handling an oxygen tank that you never leave it just standing up by itself. That if uh, you have to leave it, lay it down. Um, every five years an oxygen tank has to be hydrostatically tested uh, to make sure that it can withstand the pressure of the gas inside. Uh, if it... Uh, uh, cannot, then there's always a risk that that tank could rupture, uh, which would be, uh, you know, uh, could be very life-threatening to anybody around it uh, because it would, again, fly through the air like a, a missile or a bottle rocket and uh, uh, could hit or kill somebody. So it has to be hydrostatically tested every five years. Uh, don't drop an oxygen cylinder if at all possible. Uh, never leave it standing upright uh, without being secured. And uh, we shouldn't smoke around an oxygen equipment that's in use, although you will have those patients who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or emphysema from years and years of smoking and are on HOMO2 and still continue to smoke with their oxygen on. Again, oxygen is not flammable. It's not going to burst into flames. But should that lit cigarette, start something on fire in an oxygen-rich environment, uh, the fire is just going to burn more intense. Uh, don't use oxygen equipment around an open flame. It says never use grease, oil, or fat-based soaps um, th uh, that will be attached to an oxygen supply cylinder. Um, and, and the reason for that is they may uh, heat up under the uh, pressure and uh, it's a it's a fire hazard. Never use adhesive tape on a cylinder. Uh, never try to remove an oxygen cylinder by dragging it or rolling it on its side or bottom, uh, especially a full one. Uh, always run the risk of a, a potential puncture uh, or uh, snapping the yoke off. Um, when connected to an oxygen cylinder, uh, the pressure regulator takes that you know, 2,200 pounds per square inch and uh, provides it in a safe working pressure somewhere between 30 and 70 pounds per square inch. Now, flow meters uh, tell you how much oxygen flow you're delivering to the patient, and they allow control of the flow of oxygen uh, expressed in liters per minute. Now, low pressure flow meters um, uh, have... Uh, they're like your home regulators, your uh, oxygen concentrators, uh, where uh, they provide a constant uh, flow of, of oxygen somewhere around two liters a minute. High pressure flow meters are what are necessary uh, to be able to provide, um, well, as example, some automated CPR devices, uh, some of the older ones were... Uh, runoff of oxygen pressure. So you have to have a high flow in order to run the CPR devices. Um, ventilators often have to have a high flow. Uh, some of the older CPAP and BiPAP devices have to have a high flow. Um, the, the problem with the high pressure devices that require a high flow of oxygen in order to operate them, um, it doesn't take very long at all for you to drain a tank. Um, so many of these devices now run on battery and don't require whole, whole flow. Or uh, they, um, they have flow restricting uh, valves that, like with a CPAP device, uh, many of them are just plug and play. You plug them into a normal flow meter and based on the liters per minute that you deliver uh, determines the um, positive end expiratory pressure that you're uh, delivering with your CPAP device. And you'll learn more about CPAP uh, when you uh, uh, do some hands-on clinical 
with uh, respiratory patients. So here's a, an example of two flow meters, uh, the low pressure flow meter on the left uh, and the uh, pressure compensated flow meter and a constant flow meter on the right. Um, both can uh, run at 15 liters per minute. Uh, as you can see, the uh, low pressure flow meter is what you might find in an uh, ambulance attached to the wall, where the high pressure constant flow selector valve uh, you will find on a portable oxygen tank. Uh, here's another example of a high pressure flow meter. Uh, it's got a port there where you could screw in uh, a, um, uh, a demand valve uh, or a high pressure device that requires uh, higher than um, 30 psi to work. Humidifiers are wa a water tub that you connect to your flow meter and the oxygen boils through the water and then out to the patient and because it boils through the water it picks up that moisture. Uh, so in uh, patients who are on long-term oxygen therapy, uh, having a flow meter or having a uh, humidifier uh, just provides a, a, an element of uh, comfort to the patient. Uh, if you just constantly run uh, oxygen um, out of the tank into a patient's nose or mouth, it can dry them out uh, quite a bit. Uh, so on long transfers, humidifiers are nice. So here's an example of a humidifier that screws into an oxygen outlet uh, and then um, the oxygen flows through the water and then out to the patient. Some hazards of oxygen therapy. Uh, one of the common hazards of oxygen uh, therapy and oxygen equipment is, as I'd already mentioned, that if the tank is punctured or the valve or the yoke breaks off, it can become a missile. Uh, oxygen does support combustion. Um, oxygen can saturate uh, towels and sheets and clothing. And um, as a result, if a spark occurs, uh, they can ignite into flames uh, very easily. Uh, oxygen and oil do not mix under pressure, uh, so that's why you would avoid any oil around the um, uh, the yoke and the pin indexing system. Um, there are some rare situations where oxygen therapy is uh, uh, detrimental or toxic, um, particularly in infants who receive high flow oxygen. Uh, the oxygen around the eyes can actually cause eye damage. Um, in some patients, and this is more theoretical than any, uh, let's say your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients, those patients with emphysema and chronic bronchitis, they rely on the percentage of oxygen in their blood to trigger them to take a breath. And so the theory is that if I give them too much oxygen, uh, and they have lots and lots of oxygen in their bloodstream, they won't breathe. Uh, so we're cautioned uh, to only give a patient with uh, COPD no more than two to four liters of oxygen per minute through a nasal cannula. And that's just not true. Uh, in a patient who is starved for oxygen uh, because of some sort of pneumonia or respiratory compromise, we should never withhold oxygen from them. And if they need 100%, we should give them 100%. Oftentimes, if they quit breathing, it's more they just wear their muscles out because they've been working so hard to breathe, not that you gave them too much oxygen. And if they do quit breathing, we can assist their ventilations with a bag valve mask. When administering oxygen, um, you will be working in lab uh, with an instructor uh, who will show you the different types of equipment, how it goes together, how it's used, and the various devices are available. And you'll also be able to use those as you're doing your clinical and ride time. Now, some of the oxygen delivery equipment includes uh, oxygen masks, and a non-rebreather mask, a true non-rebreather mask, is the best way to deliver high concentration oxygen to a person who's breathing on their own. Now, with a true non-rebreather mask, you note the round discs on each side of the mask. Uh, you set a flow rate at 15 liters a minute. You fill the oxygen uh, reserve bag, and then you place it on the patient. Get a good seal by tightening the sides and uh, crimping the metal over the nose. Uh, and then as the patient inhales, uh, those two discs shut 
And the only, theoretically, the only air the patient breathes is what you're supplying. So you're supplying 100% oxygen, so they should get 100% oxygen. But if their inspiratory demand, if the amount of air, their tidal volume, if their tidal volume is more than what you can supply, then technically they could suffocate. Uh, so most non-rebreathers are actually partial non-rebreathers. They only have one rubber disc on there. The other side is open. So that if they need to, they can pull in some room air uh, to help uh, give them the tidal volume they need if they're breathing very deep and labored. So a non-rebreather at 15 liters will give you about 90%, 80 to 90% uh, oxygen uh, content. Um, there we go, a new design feature. Here they're talking about the partial non-rebreather. Uh, one side is open, so you can pull uh, uh, room air in if you need to. Nasal cannula, uh, that's going to be your best option for a patient who feels like they're suffocating when you put a mask over their face. Um, these are just nasal prongs that go into the nose. Um, and that's what a nasal cannula looks like. It's a low flow device. You typically don't go any higher than six liters per minute. Uh, it'll provide somewhere between 24 and 44 percent oxygen at a rate of uh, four to six liters a minute. Uh, the partial non-rebreather, as we mentioned, is very similar to the non-rebreather, except uh, there is uh, one of those ports that are open. Uh, it delivers 40 to 60 percent oxygen at somewhere between 9 and 10 liters a minute. Now, a Venturi mask is not something that you're going to see very often. Uh, this is a mask that, uh, depending on the flow rate and the adjustment that you make on the mask itself, you can deliver set percentages of oxygen, um, uh, very low percentages all the way to very high percentages, depending on your rate of flow. So uh, here's an example of a Venturi mask. Uh, and Venturi masks are good for, let's say that a patient needs, um, you know, 40% uh, oxygen uh, in order to maintain uh, saturation so that they're not hypoxic. Well, you know, you could give them a, a partial non-rebreather and they may get 40%. A cannula, they're not going to get 40%. A non-rebreather, they're going to get more than 40%. So if you want them to get at exactly 40% oxygen delivery, uh, then you use a Venturi mask. And depending upon the flow rate, will determine the percentage of oxygen that they get. Now, a tracheostomy mask is placed over the stoma. Uh, or the tracheostomy tube, and it helps provide supplemental oxygen to the patient who has a tracheostomy. Uh, you connect the mask and turn the flow rate to 8 to 10 liters per minute. So here's an example of a tracheostomy mask that would either fit over the stoma itself uh, or if they had like a, uh, a 15 millimeter um, uh, chimney uh, like you see on top of an endotracheal tube uh, sticking out of their trachea, then you could uh, 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 hook this portion of the mask to that and deliver uh, oxygen as well. Um, some special considerations. Just remember, as we mentioned when we were discussing airway, that facial injuries, if you've got bleeding and swelling, that uh, certainly bleeding and swelling in the face uh, can obstruct the airway and can disrupt the movement of air. Uh, you may need to suction them aggressively. Uh, you may have to use an OPA or an MPA in order to help get that uh, oxygen into the lungs. Uh, you may have to use a head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust, or call ALS for more advanced uh, measures. Um, as we mentioned again in the airway, foreign bodies can imp impede your ability to assist ventilations with a bag valve mask as well. So when you go to ventilate a patient, if you can't get their chest to rise and fall, then you know, one of the first things you want to do is reposition their head. Maybe you didn't have their airway open. And if you go to ventilate them again, you still can't get their chest to rise and fall. Then it's more than likely they have a foreign body airway obstruction. And you may need to do chest compressions in order to get it out of there. Dental appliances, again, you should leave those in place as long as they fit nicely. Uh, but if they become dislodged or are loose, then they need to come out of the mouth. Uh, otherwise, they can become an airway 
obstruction. Uh, a pediatric note, uh, hypoxia occurs rapidly in children, uh, and that's because children burn oxygen at twice the rate that we do. Uh, their lungs are much smaller, they breathe faster, their heart rates are faster, their metabolism is much faster, and um, uh, so they can become hypoxic quickly. Uh, they can turn blue really quick as a result of uh, even 30 or 40 seconds without uh, adequate oxygen supply. When we ventilate a pediatric patient, understand that their lungs are smaller. And if we're using excessive pressure when we squeeze the bag or we're squeezing too much air out of the bag, uh, we can cause barotrauma to the lungs as well as increase the amount of air in the stomach leading to vomiting. You need to use the properly sized face mask. There are different size masks for your bag valve when, you, when ventilating infants and children. If the mask is too large, uh, you have a tendency to put pressure on the eyes of the child. And when you put pressure on the eyes of the child, it stimulates that vagus nerve and it causes the heart rate to slow down. Uh, demand valves or flow-restricted oxygen ventilation devices are contraindicated and should not be used on children because of the high uh, PSI that the oxygen is delivered at. Um, we need, when we're using... Uh, uh, masks and cannulas use pediatric uh, sized uh, masks and cannulas uh, rather than just uh, taking adult stuff and hoping it works. And remember too that uh, excessive ventilation leads to gastric distension and that's going to impair your ability to ventilate because if I've got a big old air balloon underneath the diaphragm, my diaphragm can't flatten and I can't take a, a good breath. Um, now, there are some devices that require direct visualization of a glottic opening, and that's endotracheal intubation. And then there are devices that are inserted blindly into the airway. And as an EMT in Iowa, you can use these blindly inserted devices, like the combi tube, the king, uh, the... Um, uh, LMA, uh, there's a variety of different types of what we call supraglottic airways that are blindly inserted. Uh, endotracheal intubation is not within your scope, but certainly once the patient is intubated by a paramedic, there's nothing that says that you can't ventilate the patient using a bag valve mask. Now, when you're helping prepare for intubation, whether it's using the endotracheal intubation or a uh, supraglottic airway, you want to maximize oxygenation prior to the procedure. So put a mask on the patient uh, at 15 liters a minute to give them close to 100% flow of oxygen uh, and allow them to flush the nitrogen out of their system and replace it with oxygen, which will give you a lot of time to do your procedure. You want to put the patient in the sniffing position. Um, cricoid pressure is no longer recommended. This would be pressure on either side of the cricoid membrane uh, that would uh, push the larynx uh, down so that it may be visualized easier by the paramedic. And confirmation uh, needs to occur with end tidal CO2 monitoring, which is 100% sensitive and 100% uh, specific for advanced airway placement. Um, there are color metric devices that can go on the end of these tubes uh, that would indicate the presence of CO2, but you can get false positives with those if the patient has consumed carbonated beverages and you place the tube into the uh, stomach. Securing the tube in place is something that is either done with a commercially available tube holder or tape. Now, when you ventilate a patient who has an advanced airway in place, it doesn't take much movement at all to displace the endotracheal tube. Even allowing the patient to flex or having their chin touch their chest may pull the tube uh, into the hypopharynx and out of the trachea. Um, you also want to pay attention to how the lungs feel when you squeeze the bag. If the patient is really easy to ventilate, if their chest rises and falls easily, and then all of a sudden it becomes uh, harder and harder to squeeze the bag, um, that indicates that there's pressure building up inside the chest, which could be from uh, normal diseases like asthma, but it could be from you ventilating them too fast, uh, or it could be that a lung is collapsed. 
and they're developing a pneumothorax. If the patient is going to be defibrillated, unhook the bag valve mask, remove it from the tube so that you don't have uh, an oxygen-rich environment when the defibrillation occurs. And then watch for any changes in the patient's mental status. Perhaps when you start, they're unresponsive, no gag reflex. And as you continue and you start providing them 100% oxygen and you eliminate their CO2 and restore some sort of normalcy, uh, they may start to wake up. Um, in a patient who is uh, suspected of having a spinal cord injury or column injury, uh, they have to maintain a neutral inline position even during the intubation. So you may have to provide manual inline stabilization while the paramedic is doing the uh, intubation. Now, blind insertion airway devices include the King LT, and LT just stands for laryngeal tube. Um, and the laryngeal mask airway, and the LMA stands for laryngeal mask airway. Uh, the laryngeal mask airway is something that we see primarily back in OR. I don't know many ambulance services that are carrying it. It was designed specifically to be used in surgery in a patient who is deeply anesthetized, has been NPO, uh, you know, nothing to eat for the last 24 hours, no risk of vomiting, you know, those sort of things. Where the King LT, it was actually marketed as an oral pharyngeal airway uh, and uh, can be easily placed by the EMT uh, and may help um, manage that airway. And the nice thing about these blindly inserted airway devices is that once they're in place, you don't have to ha maintain a seal with a mask because there is no mask on the patient at that point. All right, so respiratory failure is the result of inadequate breathing and breathing that is insufficient to support life. And a patient in respiratory failure will progress to respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest. So when you find that patient that's in respiratory failure and you know it's failure because their level of consciousness is altered and they're working hard to breathe, uh, you need to immediately begin uh, artificial ventilations with a bag valve mask. Uh, in a breathing patient, you can deliver oxygen with um, oxygen masks and cannulas um, as well. Uh, oxygen can be administered as a therapy to a breathing patient whose breathing is inadequate or who's cyanotic, who's cool and clammy, short of breath, having chest pain, has severe trauma, or has any altered mental status. Those sort of patients would benefit initially from some oxygen. Remember to use personal protective equipment when doing airway management because they could cough, spit, vomit. You could get the blood in your eyes or mouth uh, or the vomit in your eyes and mouth. Um, the assessment of breathing must be an ongoing process, just like the assessment of the airway, because it's a dynamic process. Uh, it changes over time. Uh, we would hope that if a person had an increased work of breathing and was and was in a, uh, having a hard time, that if we provided them oxygen or assisted them with their ventilations, that they would get better. But that isn't necessarily what may happen. Uh, do note that Inadequate breathing requires your immediate action to restore adequate ventilations. Uh, if we can't do that, the patient is uh, likely to go into respiratory failure and then respiratory arrest. Um, positive pressure ventilations are very different than normal breathing and can have negative side effects if you ventilate too fast, if you ventilate with too much volume. So you want to make sure to select the most appropriate method of positive pressure ventilation based upon the needs of the individual. Uh, use uh, appropriate safety measures whenever handling oxygen and select the appropriate delivery device to provide your supplemental oxygen based on the patient need. All right, well, that pretty much uh, ends our discussion on airway and, and breathing. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know how to get a hold of me. So I'll, uh, I'll be talking to you soon.